Hey, welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast, the fastest growing podcast in women's health. Today's Monday, July 15th, 2024. So we used to have this awesome podcast called High Risk Birth Stories, where people will come on and tell their birth story. A few years ago, we rolled it into the Healthful Woman Podcast, so all of our podcasts are in one place. I decided it was time to start redropping the older birth stories onto this podcast for a few reasons. First, well, because the stories are just terrific. Second, we get a lot of requests for birth stories. They are very popular. Third, apparently, the older podcasts from the high-risk birth stories are not available anymore on podcast platforms. So we're going to start redropping them so you have an opportunity to hear them if you haven't already and so they can live on moving forward. Today's one of those redrops. This podcast was originally dropped in March of 2021, and it's the birth story of one of my favorite patients, Fortune Faham. Fortune and I discussed the pregnancy and birth of her twin boys 12 years prior to the podcast, as well as her pregnancies before and after. As a mother of eight children, she has an amazing perspective on grief, joy, and faith. Over the upcoming months, look out for more of these birth stories to redrop. I'm really excited to share them. All right, a few reminders. Uh, remember, I wrote a book with Emily Astor, The Unexpected. And if you would like to read it and buy it, you can get it anywhere you get books. Uh, also, please do continue to send in questions for our mailbag podcast. You can email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com or go to our website and click on the link that says send us your questions. Remember, these questions are for mailbags. They are not for personal medical advice. For those, you should ask your own doctor. All right. Thanks for listening. See you all next week. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Fortune, thank you so much for coming to tell your birth story. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dr. Fox. So happy to be able to be here with you. Fantastic. So Fortune, we go way back. I guess we met in 2008 for the pregnancy we're going to be talking about for your twin boys, right? That's right. Amazing. It's been a long time. And obviously, you've had birth prior to then and births after that. But we're going to focus right now uh, on the birth of your twins. And their birthdays is in December, right? That's right. December 3rd, 2008. Got it. So they, they just turned 12 and we're looking forward to the uh, the twin bar mitzvah, I guess, in December. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Time flies. Take us back to 2008. This is when you got pregnant with them. And prior to then, you had multiple pregnancies and children already. And, you know, tell us about that sort of what was your, your history coming into this pregnancy? My my journey really started in, I would say, 1999 when I had my first son. I had one in 1999, very easy, uncomplicated birth, healthy baby, everything good. Then I had another one in 2001 and another one in 2003. The first two were really very uncomplicated, full-term deliveries. Everything was, you know, went smoothly. With my third, I started to really have issues. I had a short cervix from really early on in the pregnancy. We saw it probably at 24 weeks. Um, and then I was dilated two centimeters from when I was like 28 weeks. And we started to real the doctor that I was with at the time started to really worry that, oh boy, are we gonna be able to keep this baby in? So at the time they prescribed a lot of bed rest and I was on a tubuline pump to hopefully try to slow down the contractions that I was getting. And at the end, I gave birth to my third at 35 weeks. Yeah. So he was born. He actually struggled to breathe a little bit right after birth, stayed in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then came home. And now he's 17 and he's six foot two and <laughs> everything's good. Thank God. Right. But at the time it was a bit scary. Definitely was, you know, the nurse had seen him in the middle of the night, like struggling to breathe. So they moved him to the ICU and he got the help that he needed. But definitely I was somebody that, you know, had a little bit of a condition of preterm uh, labor and preterm delivery. Right. And it was interesting that it, that, that it sort of just happened out of nowhere in the third pregnancy and you didn't have it in your first two. Right. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Um, 
So um, fast forward after that, like about three years late, four years later, maybe I got pregnant. I actually found out that I was having a girl and that was really exciting to me after having three boys. And then later on in the pregnancy, we noticed that the doctor noticed, he didn't notice early enough, but he noticed that at 32 weeks that there was something wrong with the baby's heart and the baby didn't seem like it was the issue was going to make it. And so I had to struggle with that tremendous loss. I gave birth at 37 weeks and after two days, the baby passed away from heart disease. So that was a real, real struggle in my life. And how long after that loss did you get pregnant with the twins? Was it a long time or was it a short time? Two years later, uh, I would say. And, um, you know, I, I just, for people out there that are, you know, struggling with loss, you know, I think a very big message that I would put out there is that like, it's the, the your mental state is so important. Here I was somebody that ne never, never struggled to conceive. And right after I lost my baby, I was like, I want to get pregnant today, like now. Mm. And when I tried to conceive, and I never had trouble conceiving before that, it just wasn't happening for me. And I, it took me time to realize that, you know, being in that depressed state and not, you know, picking myself up enough and getting myself to a better place, it was affecting my body's physical ability to conceive. It took me a good year and a half to really like sort of grieve and mourn and find a way to get past it. And once I like start, let go of the pain, I, that's when I that's when I conceive. And boy, was I lucky that I got twins. <laughs> it's so interesting you mentioned that because a, a lot of people after they have a loss, they're not ready to conceive again just because the the pain is too much. And I know you said that you were you really wanted to get pregnant right away, and others don't feel that way. And obviously, it's individualized. Some people feel like you did, and they want to you know conceive right away, and other people are just not ready. But the fact that you were ready and had a difficult time conceiving, that must have just compounded your loss after the last pregnancy, that not only did you have this you know, really horrific experience, but now you can't get pregnant as easily as you wanted to. How? What was that like for you during that year and a half? It made things so hard for me. I remember thinking at the time, oh my goodness, I, I didn't want to be done with three kids. I'm never going to have any more babies. And it actually... My, I feel like it compounded the pain because every month that I didn't conceive, it was like I was reliving like the baby that I should have had. So it was, it was really, really tough for me. It really, it was, it was a, it was a very hard time. I was really lucky, and I want to put that out there to others. That I had a really, I have a really one of my best friends is a is a clinical social worker, and she she was with me the whole time through through my loss and through my struggle to conceive again and. Just, I think it's really important to, to note that, that having somebody out there, a professional, a, a friend, a family, a support system is so important when people, when you're going through a tough time in life, because we can't do it alone. Yeah, 100%. And so when you got pregnant with the twins, was it a moment of great excitement for that reason? Or was it, you know, extremely scary? Because now not only you know, are you pregnant again and all these things might happen, but it's twins and it's a high risk pregnancy. What were your initial emotions? Well, I remember the nurse called me and she said, you're definitely pregnant because I had, I had uh, gone and done, done blood work. She says, are there twins in your family? So I said, actually, yeah, my, my uncles are twins. My brother, my brother-in-law has twins. But why do you ask? She goes, because your numbers are really, really elevated. It's possible that it's a multiple pregnancy. So I laughed it off thinking, nah, can't be. But then when I went for the sonogram and they showed me the two heartbeats, it was actually for me, it was a moment of like, a, for initially of a, so much joy. Like mm. here I felt like, wow, like here I'm getting my catch up baby for the one that I lost. Like for me, it was really, really exciting. But at the same time, like you said, it was really, once I stopped to really reflect and think about it, I start to get really nervous. Like how am I going to carry these babies to term? Like on my third, I made it to 35 weeks and that was with a lot of intervention and I can't carry twins. It's just like my body won't do it. I, my body dilates too soon. Like I was really like, I, I don't know how we're going to get there. At the beginning, it was a lot of joy. And then it was like, oh boy, how are we going to make this happen? Is that why you came over to our practice in a quote, quote unquote, a high risk practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. So at the time when I conceived, I really did the research and I, you know, I said, uh, I need 
you know, the best doctors in New York. You tell me who it is. I don't care if they take my insurance, whatever it is. I, I need the best doctors. And they weren't available. So you found us. <laughs> and that, definitely you you are you were the best then and everyone knows it now i don't know was it was the practice as big at the time how many years is this practice going dr fox so the practice started in its current iteration in 2005 so a few years before it was originally an nyu practice the critical moment was in 2008 which is this year that both you joined the practice and I joined the I practice. We, we started yes. at the same time at MFM Associates. We were both babes and we both started <laughs> okay. together at the same time. So yeah, I mean, when we met, I mean, it was probably one of your you know earlier visits and it was one of my, you know, I, I joined in July, 2008. So that's five months before your twins were born. So it was right in the beginning of your pregnancy. Right, exactly. That was right when I, I came over. So um, when I found out about the practice and I did a little research, I said, like, this is what I need. And for me, I had my first son with one doctor. It's funny because my first was with one. My second one was with another one. My third son was with a, a different one. So I had three different doctors on my three first children. Then on the baby that I lost, there was another doctor also. So talk about, and I'm not the type that really is like, always looking for change, but somehow each time something wasn't right. Then when I came over to the practice and I remember meeting you and Dr. Rebarba and I was just like, oh, wow. I took this like big sigh of relief, like, thank you, God, because it was just, I don't know, there's the warmth and the confidence I had in the professionalism and just like the realness, like, you know, you find doctors that have a good bedside manner, but then they, you know, they really just like, small time and they don't they're not as you know professional and not as specialized in high risk situations and then you find doctors that are really you know the best in their field but then they just they just don't know how to interact with a patient and then it so just the, the combination it was just like I, I knew that i found my home and just for those out there i ended up having five more kids with <laughs> <laughs> this practice. So I, even though I had four different doctors from my four first pregnancies, this 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 was a long-standing relationship going forward. Wow. Well, thanks for the plug. Now I'm really glad I had you on the podcast. <laughs> At first, I just thought it'd be a you know a really fascinating story, but now this is like uh you know an advertisement. So I really that's awesome. I appreciate that. And, and you know you you say how wonderful it was, but little did you know all the crazy things we were going to do to you in that twin pregnancy. Maybe oh, <laughs> maybe boy. you would have felt differently oh, if you would have known. So <laughs> no, 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 no. It was all good. Anything to get the good outcome. The truth. I think that's what we all want at the end. As as moms carrying these babies, we just we want everything to end well. So just having you guys holding my hand the whole way through that 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 was that was very that was comforting for me and it just it made it it made it so manageable it really did you know it's hard to know the right thing to do there's not great data you know on twins in general what's the best way to manage them or twins with someone with a prior you know preterm labor preterm birth but on top of that you had term births and you know the daughter that you lost from heart disease obviously that's that's a risk and we have to check the hearts but that pregnancy went full term without you know the same issues and so it's a little bit confusing you know why would you have some pregnancies that are totally uncomplicated and other pregnancies that are complicated and then how do we manage twins and so you know a lot of it is i mean you're winging it almost i mean you're using the best data we have and you know knowledge and experience but there isn't you know a cookbook for how to do this right and you just have to sort of be I guess, flexible. So for your pregnancy, you have these concerns. I know we did look uh, at the baby's hearts. Unfortunately, they both look really, really, you know, normal and healthy and good. So it doesn't make you not worry about it, but certainly you worry less about it when the hearts look perfect. And then what happened after that around, you know, 20, 22 weeks? So um, I was coming for visit to be on the cautious side. I was coming every maybe two, three weeks at that point. And when I came from that visit, you know, I I'm somebody that I'm really in touch with my body and I felt like, oh boy, I don't know. I feel like a lot of pressure. Like, I don't know, just make sure everything's good. And I remember being checked and saying, oh boy, your cervix is short. And I was told, wait, let, let, let's let's see what we're going to do about it. And then I remember Dr. Barber saying, you know, I really think that, that it would make sense to put in a saclage, to put in a stitch and to try to, you know, keep the pregnancy going and, you know, to stop the progression of of the short cervix. And I was like, oh boy, uh, here we go. This, right. is, this is, this is, this is it now. Right. And you know, I, 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 
I, I really trusted the doctors. I, 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 and I think that was when I met you, Dr. Fox. I remember, I remember when you, you, so doctor, I was lucky enough to have the two that I felt the most connected to in the practice there that night doing the saclage for me. And I really yeah, had it was, a lot it was, of, it was like in the middle of the night, wasn't it? It was, it was. I remember by the time we did it, because I had the loss before, I didn't tell anybody I was having twins. Mm. So all of a sudden I'm going into the hospital and everyone's like, why are you going into the hospital? What's going on? I'm like, ah, short cervix. I had this with my third. It's fine. We're putting in a stitch. And I I played it down, but just having the doctors, you, you there, I remember when you did it, it, you, you were joking the whole time. The personality that you have today is the one you had then. And, and, and you really, you made me comfortable and that was great. And so we had this stitch put in, I think it was like a special kind of stitch, right? What was it? Was it like a special kind or they're all the same? Your cervix was actually open a little bit also. It wasn't just short. It was about a centimeter to two dilated open. Uh, when we when we decide whether to put in a stitch or not, there's a lot of controversy over that. But when the cervix is dilated, most people agree the best thing to do is put in a stitch. And um, I mean, the way we do it, and this is, you know, where Barbara trained me is one called a charadkar. It's just a certain type. Um, so not a lot of people do it. In our practice, we do it almost, you know, entirely, about 100% of them are charadkars. But it's special because where Barbara is, he's the best at it, at placing them. He's just awesome. And, you know, he trained most of us how to do it. So you got you got his skill and my personality. So <laughs> it was a good combination. Because if you got, you know, my skill and his personality, forget about it. It would have been a bad outcome. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. I got the best of both worlds. Thank God. Thank God. And so fortunately, that did go well. And even though it was, it was a scary moment and you're there, you, you did go home and things sort of, you know, settled down in terms of the preterm labor for a while, right? I mean, things were pretty calm for another several months, I think. Right, right. No, things things were progressing well. I was 28 weeks. I was 30 weeks. I was 30. And then at 32 weeks, I remember feeling, oh boy, I'm in labor. Oh my goodness. It's like not stopping these contractions. I'm in so much pain. I, I was like, I think I'm breaking through the stitch. I don't know what's going on. I pulled up and I, and I said, something's not right. And they said, okay, come over to the hospital. So I remember going over to the hospital and seeing Dr. Silverstein. Is he still there? Yeah, he's right next door to me right now. (laughs) Oh, okay. So um, Dr. Silverstein checked me and he said, I think this stitch needs to come out. But I think the fear was that like I would rip through it and that would be worse. I think that's what he had said, right? Yeah, if you're contracting, you know, if the uterus is contracting very strongly, the stitch is not, A, it's not going to help because the problem isn't the cervix, the problem is you're contracting. And B, it could actually be harmful because if you keep contracting, uh, and that knot is there, the cervix can tear. So once someone sort of goes into labor with a stitch in place, we do remove it. We try to remove it before someone goes into labor, but obviously if you're very preterm, you know, sometimes people go into labor first. So yes, it was it was time to remove it. So it got removed. And I think at that time you probably got, you know, steroids to help the lungs mature and, you know, the medicines again, like you got last time. Did you think they were going to deliver at that time? Like when you came into the hospital, were you like, that's did. it, I'm delivering my babies? I did. I remember thinking, okay, thank God I got to 32 weeks. Cause I remember, you know, when you're pregnant with twins, you, you, every week is like, okay, I got to 28 weeks. Now they're viable. I got to 32 weeks. They say that's the, okay, right. once you're 32 weeks, it's fine. These babies are going to be, you know, they're going to make it in the long run and they're right. not going to have any sort of deficiencies. Right. So, um, I, even though I wasn't happy about delivering that time, when I walked into the hospital, I was sure I was delivering. Wow. And I remember Dr. Silverstein saying, okay, we're going to take it out. And I said, well, where's my epidural? He goes, I go, I got an epidural to get in and you're just going to take it out. And he took it out and boy, did you hear me screaming? <laughs> but, um, I remember it. I don't forget it, but, um, yeah, it was over in a second, in a minute. And, and once it was out, I thought that that, that was it. I was going to be giving birth and I was really like, but I'm not ready. And these babies are not ready. And then somehow things sort of just settled down, which was so unexpected. Like the uterus calmed down. And then like, I don't know, somehow right. he's like, okay, you're going to go home. Some people deliver within a few days of this, and then some people can just hang around. And I kind of said, I think I'm, I don't even know if I'm going to make it home. So wow. it was really unexpected. Right. And you went back on that, the terbutaline pump, that, that medication to stop the contract. We were still using it back then. I mean, even then it was somewhat of a controversial medication because it wasn't clear that it worked uh, in anybody, let alone in twins. Nowadays, you know, very, very few people use it. We don't use them anymore. 
Um, there's been more and more data that it's not helpful and more and more data that might even be harmful, not to the babies, but to the mother. So you survive. So that's okay. But, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's when we look at these things, you know, it's just fascinating. We have no idea, like, did you stay pregnant because you were getting that medication, meaning it did help you? Or did you get pregnant in spite of getting that medication, meaning it didn't make a bit of difference and you would have stayed pregnant regardless? And it's so hard to know what these things, and it just, you know, it, it gives us so much humility over the recommendations we make. And listen, the same is true with the cerclage. I don't know for sure what would have happened if you didn't get the cerclage. Maybe it helped you. Maybe it didn't because, you know, even after it got removed, you were pregnant another, what, three weeks? I think you delivered around 30. Four, four. Yeah, you delivered four like 36, weeks. 36 plus weeks. I mean, these babies were, they were like five pounds. They were big. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, the, you know, it's so interesting what you're saying because even like from my third pregnancy, where I was on the tributylene pump and I literally moved into my house, my, my mother's house with my children so she can help me take care of them because they told me I am not allowed to get up only to go to the bathroom. And when I came to your practice and all of a sudden they're like, listen, I'm not telling you to go run a marathon, but you're allowed to live your life and be normal even though you're having a high risk pregnancy. To me, it was like, oh, it was so refreshing. And I think it speaks to what you're saying about how sometimes the old approach is not the current approach and, and things are like totally evolving all the time. Yeah, we were always pretty negative on bed rest. You know, even back then, we we're like, it doesn't work. It's just going to be annoying. And, you know, so we weren't really prescribing it then anyways. The the medications, you know, because they weren't really thought to be so dangerous. We're like, all right, like worst case scenario, it's dumb and it doesn't work, but like whatever. But yeah, so bed rest, no. So you, you, you made it to 36 plus weeks. You ultimately did go into labor, you know, officially. Uh, you delivered them both vaginally, right? Yes, they were both vaginal. That was with uh, with Dr. Clauser. Yeah, a blessed memory. Did he pass? Yeah, Dr. Oh, Clauser passed. That. He passed away a few years ago. It was pretty horrible. He was such a kind man. So, so, so kind and so gentle. And you had the two boys. And, so I had two boys. <laughs> and, and did they have to spend any time in the NICU? No. So that was the, that was such a blessing for me. Um, my twin A was about five pounds. Twin B was six pounds. And they were, oh, I, I still tell them now, they're 12 years old. I always say, you know what the happiest day of my life was? And they always, all my kids always say, what the day you got married? Oh, I go, no, no, the day the twins were born. And everyone's like, why them? But it was just, it was such a, it was such a moment for me, you know, even after, especially with all the history and just having been able to deliver them full term and for them to be able to come home a day and a half later with me, it was just, it was a miracle. Yeah. I mean, you're coming off, you know, a, a loss of a daughter and then difficulty conceiving and then a very, you know, scary pregnancy with a lot going on and it could have gone in many different directions. And here you are having an uncomplicated birth of two healthy boys who are coming home with you in two days, right. which is, you know, it's, it's miraculous. It's awesome. And so it doesn't mean you love them more than your other kids, although you might, <laughs> but it just means that, you know, in terms of the, the, yeah, the gratitude, I mean, you can't possibly have that sort of gratitude with your first or second kid. And when you, you know, you don't know any better or, you know, you, know, you have no idea all the things that can go wrong in the world. And here you are with so much more perspective on it and how much more meaningful it is that things went right. Absolutely. You know, I also want to share that at the time, Dr. Clauser, I delivered twin A and he was head down. Mm -hmm. And then twin B was not. Twin B was, I think he was to the side or his feet. And Dr. Clauser was like, he was a miracle worker. He like, stuck, you know, he got his hands in there and he turned this baby. And it was to me, like, I, I, I have a sister-in-law that also has twins. So she delivered her first baby vaginally. And then the second baby was breached. And so she had, she delivered vaginally and she had a C-section oh. for baby B. So I, I was like, you know, I think that that's where you see the difference by being with a high risk doctor that knows what they're doing. That's really got the skill to really be able to have that better outcome. So for me, I was really, really grateful, you know, that he was able to do that for me. Yeah. I mean, obviously having, you know, having a C-section of twins is not a bad outcome if you have two healthy babies, but for many women, they can deliver vaginally and you're the ideal candidate. I mean, you've delivered four babies before vaginally, you're healthy, you're thin. I mean, there's not, you're, you're fine. And so even if twin B is not in the right position, there are maneuvers to do to deliver them. It's just an issue of being trained to do them. And some people have that training and some people uh, unfortunately don't. And it's not necessarily their fault. A lot of training programs don't have enough opportunity. People don't see enough or do enough. And so in our practice, it's one of the things we've been very proud of that we, you know, do deliver twins vaginally, even when the second one is not 
uh, head down. And it's, listen, it's great for you. Your recovery is so much easier. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Mm -hmm. It was easy. Thank God. Not even a stitch. I, it was really, it was really great. Amazing. And so, so now that they're born and you're home, how was your recovery from the birth in terms of just, you know, physically it sounded like it was pretty good, but also just emotionally. Now you have two more newborns. Is it like gruesome hard or is it like total joy because you have these two healthy babies? How did it go total for you? Total joy. Total, total joy. Um, yeah. Like I, I could see how maybe some people would feel overwhelmed for me. It was like, thank you, God. Um, I, I, I will wake up. I will figure out how to do it. And it's interesting because somehow I don't remember a hard day raising them. I don't remember a hard day feeding them. Somehow they would just, I would prop them in the little bouncer with the bottle and they would drink and then I would pick them up and burp them and it was so easy. And yet the other babies like that I had afterwards would kill me. I would have to sit and hold them and hug them. And so something about twins, they become very independent and they were just really good natured. So I was, I was blessed and it really went really well for me. I, it was all joy for me. Yeah. I was going to get to that. So now you have five children at home, five boys, and you have the memory of your daughter. And you decide you're still going and you had ultimately, ultimately three more, right? Three more. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Two years after I had my twins, I said, I'm afraid, you know, I think that, you know, once you struggle with second infertility, mm -hmm. um, you start to think like, oh boy, you know, maybe I just got lucky that I got pregnant with those twins. Like maybe I really can't conceive again. And so a after two years, I said, you know what, uh, we're going to get rid of this birth control and we're going to see. And boom, I was pregnant the first month. And I was, and, and that's where I really like realized that a lot of that mental energy of just, you know, being positive and, 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 you know, being emotionally healthy is so important to conception. So I got pregnant with my six. Thank God it was a really uncomplicated pregnancy. He was actually my first baby, believe it or not. He was actually one day overdue. I only, right. This is the only one that ever went past the due date. Right. Isn't that, that crazy? Was baby number six. And we didn't yes, do any. Yes. And we didn't do anything. Like there was no. You didn't have a circlage. You didn't have medicine. Like nothing. It just you know this is this pregnancy was after your due date. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Again, it yes. shows. It just shows you how we have no idea which of these interventions do and don't help necessarily for an individual person. And it was. I remember it was really interesting. We're talking that pregnancy. What are we going to do? Like, how are we going to treat you in this pregnancy? And I think we just watched you closely, but didn't actually do anything interventional. And it worked out. So, so, so you had your, you had another boy. I had another boy. So the, here I am with my six boys. And then I don't know about, about, about it. Uh, no, then actually my, I'll never forget it. My husband tells this story all the time. The sixth boy was three and a half months old. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm a little late. And um, I was using birth control, I can tell you that for sure. And I'm like, nah, can't be. And then I, I did a pregnancy test and sure enough, there it was, a positive pregnancy test, even when I didn't want to be pregnant. And I said, okay, I called my husband. I remember he was away in China at the time. And I said, are you sitting down? And he said, no, why? And I said, I'm pregnant. He's like, what, are you crazy? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't do this, you did this. So um, it was that kind of thing. But you know, after the initial shock set in, we 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 got excited about it, and we said, you know, we're not in charge in this world. So right, it's the exact opposite of your other experience. So one, you know, after the other pregnancy, you you're trying to get pregnant and you can't, and now you're not trying to get pregnant and you do. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that was another another uncomplicated pregnancy and another boy, right? Another boy. So I had my seven boys. Yes, I gave birth. It was a full term pregnancy, you know, maybe a week or two early. And, and he was, yeah, everything was everything went really smoothly and really well. And that was when I said, we are done. Right. Okay? So well, and that's the one I, you that's the one you named after me. That's that's your yes, baby, Nathan. Yes, that's my baby, Nathan. Right. He's not or, baby or, or, not. or your grandfather, one of the two. Yeah. I know. <laughs> He's really named after my father, but I like you a lot, Dr. Fox, so I'll give you the credit. It's too. fine. It's fine. It's just, it could be both. There's no uh -huh, problem. Uh -huh. That works. That works. Definitely. So at that point, we really felt like, thank you. We're done. I was I was really satisfied. I When I got married, it's funny because people, people go into marriage thinking, oh, I want two kids, a boy and a girl. I walked in saying, I only want three kids. I don't want a big family. And then somehow life happens and, right. and you... You lose a baby and then you realize how much you want babies. And then all of a sudden you have all these other babies and then they're, here I am and I have seven. I'm like, whoa, how'd I get here? You know, I didn't set out for this. So I, at that time I was really done and I put in my IUD and I was like, okay, this is, this is it. And then a bunch of years later, I would think Nathan was already 
he must have been like four or five. My grandmother kept saying, have one more, have one more. And I'm like, <laughs> Grandma, I have seven. Are you crazy? You only have four. Why are you telling me you have more? She's like, you never know. If you have a daughter, it'll be so good. And if you have one more boy, it'll be in with the bunch. So I was like, yeah, is she crazy? And I kept thinking about it. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to take out the IUD. Who knows? Maybe. And the, the, that was the greatest. That was like the biggest miracle. I took out the IUD. I actually, at the time, I was already 36. So I was like at a different stage. You know, I had my first baby at 19. So now I'm 36. I'm above the 35-year-old sort of threshold of, of, you know, it's a more of a high risk thing. And I actually conceived, I think twice and, and miscarried both times. So then I said, you know, maybe like my body's done, you know, maybe that's what it was. And then, and then I got pregnant and it was strong and everything was good. And at that time, uh, I remember talking to Dr. Fox about it. There was at 10 weeks at the time before that in my other pregnancies, they didn't have this, but right. at 10 weeks, they can just take blood work. Right? And right. from the blood work, they can tell you the gender of the baby. Right. They check all, you know, sort of birth defects and anomalies right. and for stuff gene- like for that. Gene- so- for genetics, for chromosomal problems, right. Either NIPT is sort of what we use or the, the we were using Panorama, which is the, the right. brand name of the company. But yeah, it's a blood test to find out about, about Down syndrome, about whether it's a boy or a girl. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, that was around, in tw- that was around when you were pregnant with her and it wasn't really around uh, during Nathan's pregnancy. Right. So at the time I was, you know, you have to also realize after having a pregnancy where you have a baby with such, you know, big big defects. Right. Every single time it was like a miracle for me when things were good. You don't get used to that. So even after I had had two healthy, the twins that were healthy and then two other babies, even when I was pregnant here, I wanted to, you know, some sort of assurance that things are looking good. So I did the blood test. I remember where I was standing, Dr. Fox, when you called and you, you said, everything looks good. Do you want to know the gender? And I was like, I, I know I want to know, but I'm scared to know. What if it's another boy? But it would be good. It would be a blessing. I knew it would be a blessing. I said, you know what? Tell me. And I remember you telling me it's a girl. And I said, no, it's a mistake. And I remember screaming. Do you remember me screaming on the phone? I do. I was screaming. I do. I remember. <laughs> I, I, you know, some of those calls you really remember. It's, um, you know, it's not that often you get to call someone who has seven boys and say they're having a daughter, especially after someone lost a daughter. I mean, it's like it's it's crazy exciting at that time. Yeah. It really was very, very, very special. And I was so happy to have you on the other end sharing that news with me. So that also was like a really good pregnancy. Everything went really well. Delivery was great. You know, I was um, living in Jersey at the time because it was the summer. I go to Jersey for the to Jersey for the summers. So like getting to the hospital was a bit of a struggle. I had a few actually false labors, I, I you know, where I thought I was in labor and I wasn't. But then, then you know, at the end, um, everything went really smoothly and... My daughter is now three and a half, and we have a really, really, really lively home, but a very, very, very grateful and excited home as well. So everything's really, we're, we're really blessed. Right. I was going to ask you, your 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 oldest is, I guess, uh, 21, almost 22, right? Yeah. Yeah. Turning 22 in April. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, and you're, you're coming on that age. Have you thought about what it's going to be like to be a grandmother? Wow, Dr. Fox, you're really jumping ahead with that. You know, um, I don't I don't know if he's just ready yet. We probably still have another few years before that. It's interesting because you you, you when you're young and dumb and you have your first baby and things go smoothly, you don't realize the 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 miracle and and everything going well. So yeah, I mean it would be really exciting to get to that next stage and to to have grandchildren and I, I look forward to it at the right time. But I also I, I think that being older and, and knowing what can go wrong and the, all the different difficulties that, that can that can arise. I think just being able to appreciate when things do go right. I, it, it, I don't know. I think that only comes with age, Dr. Fox. I don't know if you can, any, any, I don't know that a young person can really uh, understand that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, you've, you've obviously in the in the world of pregnancy, you've been around the block a couple of times. And if someone came to you for advice, you know, someone she's either about to get married or about to, you know, she's married and think I'm going to have kids, uh, whether it's, you know, you know, one of your own kids or just someone, you know, what advice would you give to them before they're starting pregnancy? Would you even give them anything and, you know, at all, you know, saying that, you know, maybe they can't even grasp it's not worth it, but is there advice you'd give to somebody? No, I actually think that I wouldn't. Um, I think, you know, there's, 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 there's a place for just being young and dumb and things go right. And, and and if you can get through your whole life like that, where things just go smoothly, you know, I'll be happy for you. And 
I don't think that we need to really like alert them about all the different difficult things that that can happen. You know, I think that another thing that I would share is, you know, you said it before, and I don't want to belittle the doctors, but when I had lost my baby and the baby had uh, a major heart defect, and at the time I remember someone suggested to go for genetic testing. So my husband and I went for genetic testing and it comes out with like this really sort of like very professional report and the report had your chances of getting a baby with Down syndrome is this, your baby of having, your chances of having a baby with, with this defect and that defect. And it gives you a whole sort of list, one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in 600, one in 82. And it, it really scared me. Like the, I remember at the time, after I had had my three boys and I had lost my baby, they had scared me that like, maybe, maybe you're good. Like maybe you should just be good because your chances of get, of having another baby with a birth defect, there's one in 82 in this one. That's not so low, one in 82. Right. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, sometimes having that knowledge could be helpful, but sometimes you also have to just take everything with a grain of salt. And just for me, I guess my faith helps me that, you know, there's a higher there's a higher authority in this world. So um, I also don't, I think it's important to know that people have to take the science that's out there, but, you know, incorporate it into your own life and, and make educated decisions and not allow it to paralyze you or to cause a lot of anxiety for you. So I was really lucky that I was able to look at that report and then just say, you know what, I'm good. And I just was able to like, just put it away. And, 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 and look, I was, I'm so lucky that I did because I had five healthy children afterwards. Yeah. What you're saying is really important. I totally agree. And, you know, these tests, before we do them, we talk to people about them before we say, listen, do you want us to do this or not? And I think that that's really important because sometimes these tests just get sent as sort of a routine thing. Oh, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then you get these results back. And for some people, it's horrifying and they don't want these results. And so we have to talk about say, listen, do you want to know what your risk is? And some people do, and some people don't. And even for those who do, you have to sort of present it in a way that's, you know, both understandable, but also put it in context and what is it that they're looking for? And it has to be individualized. And I agree, it's not something that you just want to throw out there at people because it can cause a tremendous amount of anxiety that they didn't sign up for. I don't even remember it being a conscious decision, but it was just like I, I was given over the information and somehow I was able to just take it and say, okay, this, this is what it is. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see what life brings. So I, 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 I want to put that out there to people because I think that a lot of people can get paralyzed from that and, and then just say, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to tempt fate kind of thing. And, 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 and that's not how this world works. We've seen people, um, you know, have difficult pregnancies and then all of a sudden have, you know, healthy babies and, 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 and smooth, smooth pregnancy. So I think it's important to just be hopeful that, you know, each time is its own, you know, its own sort of bride. And I think that, you know, no, just your, your, your past doesn't predict your future really um, with these things. You can use it to, to, to make good decisions, but it doesn't mean that just because you had a bad outcome once that it's going to always be that way. Yeah. I was going to ask you that, you know, obviously we've known each other a long time and, you always appear to be very calm, right? You just seem to be very calm, relaxed, and you don't appear anxious at all. And that may just be your demeanor. How do you present that way with all this crazy stuff going on with your pregnancies, with your life, and all the things that can go wrong and you know about them? Is it your faith that you mentioned before, or is there something else about it that either you're always this way or you learned from your pregnancies that it's able to keep you so you know, at ease, despite all the craziness? I would say that I, by nature, I'm, I'm not an anxious person. I'm, I'm, I think that some people, you know, some people are just born that way, where they have a temperament where well, I have a friend that tells me, oh my gosh, I think I'm getting cancer. Like, you know, I, I, that's not my style. Right. I'm a much more laid back kind of person. But I definitely think my faith is a big thing. For me, it's been so helpful because when you sort of resign yourself that you're not the one in charge and we're along for the ride, it allows me to just live and to just sort of accept and, and, and sort of just go with it. And, and yeah, I definitely think that when you look back at, you know, let's say I think of something that I was really, really worried about. And then if you can fast forward a year and then you see that, oh, it never even came to fruition, never even happened. And why was I even wasting time and energy worrying about it? It allowed me to like sort of 
let go of those small anxieties that I had in my life because I realized that most of them never even end up becoming an issue or presenting themselves. So yeah, definitely. I think that with time we, we learn. And I, and honestly, Dr. Fox, I got eight kids. I, I work as a life coach. I, um, I volunteer. I'm a vice president of a social services organization. I think the lack of time also helps a lot with the <laughs> lack of uh, time to be anxious. You're you too know busy to I mean? be anxious. Yeah. I, I want, I wanted, I wanted to touch on that. If you could talk a little bit about sort of where you are now that you are a life coach and talk about, you know, SBH, which is the organization you're involved in first, just, you know, what do you do and what are these? And then I'll sort of ask you how it might relate to, you know, to your pregnancy history. I'm a vice president of a social service organization in my in my community. It's called SBH. SBH is an organization that helps people facing difficulty, be it financial, medical, emotional, sort of anything. Most recently, we launched a new division called our fertility division. In the past, uh, we felt I think it's really like a worldwide issue where fertility had been a little bit of a taboo tub- topic where people weren't really talking about it so much or people were embarrassed about it and and it wasn't so widely spoken about. And so in our community, especially, it was like that because in the Jewish community, sort of these things sometimes tend to be like swept under the rug and not spoken about. So we opened this fertility program. I would, it's about a year and a half ago. And now it's really become very robust. It's a huge division by us. We have women that are struggling conceiving, that are matched up with peers that have been through, let's say, a similar type of uh, medical issue um, and can understand, have gotten to the other side and can be a support system for them. We have um, support groups for people struggling with fertility. We have support groups for people dealing with loss. I recently attended a loss training where, you know, you really trained on going into the hospital and helping somebody through that loss. Like I remember when I had lost my baby, when I had delivered that baby, how traumatic it was. And I I was just doing it alone. Like I knew at the time instinctively that I wanted to hold my baby till she took her last breath, but some people are not as smart and then they have regrets later on. So we really have a, a, a fertility division that really deals with all different types of, any type of issue related to fertility or loss or stillborn or anything. And we're really there to support them. I, I just heard the other day that, you know, we, I, like I said, we started a year and a half ago. We actually have four women that are pregnant and due within the spring, which is really, really exciting. You know, I, you, you don't always have such success with people struggling with infertility. But yeah, the fact that we have four babies that are hopefully going to be born soon due to our help, it's, it's really, really exciting. And I think it's a great resource for anybody that's struggling with fertility and and can use the support, you know, you're not alone. And I think that it makes it so much more manageable when you realize that there are other people out there that are going through the same thing and you can sort of lean on each other. It's really, it makes, it makes the burden much, much lighter. Wow. And do you feel like you're involved in this specifically because of everything you went through as a mother? Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, when you feel like you have what to give because it's 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 an experience that you've had in your life. When I heard about it, I I, I said, Oh, I need to be a part of this because it speaks to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially when they were working on the loss training, I even got a call last night that can I go on a loss call. I, I happen to not have been available, but just having been through my own loss, you want to help somebody else that's going through a similar struggle and 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 help them through it and, you know, in, in a way that might be better than you went through it. So definitely, I think our experiences in our lives lead us to the to the work that that we become passionate about, for sure. Right. It's so interesting because you said before that you probably wouldn't burden a new mom with all the horrible things that could happen to her and her and her fertility journey. And I agree. It's not like there's no reason to sit someone down and say, here's the 50 terrible things that could happen to you. On the other hand, for people who are going through that, you want there to be sort of open conversation about it and resources and the ability for them to find somebody and find out that this is not so uncommon, that a lot of people struggle, that you're not alone, all those things. And to try to balance those two ideas of not throwing out, you know, all the horrible things in front of people, but being available to them if things aren't going right is a really important balance. And I think it's just amazing that you've volunteered your time and your experience 
and your own personality and all your efforts to this cause. I, I really think it's amazing. And the people who you're going to help are going to really appreciate it, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to, yeah, I want to offer that to, you know, any of your patients that, that feel like they can use a little help. Definitely SBH, the fertility division is, is there to help. How do they find SBH? What does it stand for? Is there a website? Is there a phone number? What's the best way to, to find you? The phone number is 718-787-1100. And they could just be asked, asked to be transferred to the fertility division. It's that simple. Fantastic. Fortune, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> you, you were sort of like, why do you want to talk to me? And I'm like, you, like you've like you been through so much. It's, you're so interesting and you're so easy I to don't talk to. I think it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. And so, yeah, but it's, and, and you know that obviously, you know, I love talking to you. You know, we've known each other a long time. I've been through a Dr. lot. Dr. Fox, am I still your favorite patient? You used to tell me I'm your favorite patient. I always said you're my favorite doctor. But I, but I said, I think he tells that to everybody. So guys, if he tells you that you're his favorite patient, just know that I, he said that one before. Well, it, it could be that you're also my first favorite patient. How about that? Uh, okay. Okay. You're qualifying it. That works. That works. Okay. Wonderful. Sounds good. Thanks, Okay. Fortune. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thank you. I always enjoy talking to Fortune. She has an amazing perspective on life, and it is no surprise that she now volunteers her time to help others. Hard to imagine someone with eight children having a lot of spare time, but she makes it work. For those of you interested, the organization she was referring to is SBH, or the Sephardic Bikur Holim, which can be found online at www.sbhonline.org. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only and does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.